Give a warm applause for Dr. Benjamin Leo Bordirski. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and he's designing quantitative computer models and global nitrogen cycle simulation. So it's like Civilization 8, nor with more realistic. And what we can learn from it and what, how we can use it, you will hear now. Station. Um, uh what we are doing there is we are doing um, uh, computer simulations um, of all kind of uh, sciences, from natural sciences to social sciences. Um, uh, but this campus has actually a long history already of science. So it used to be the astrophysical institute, uh, the astrophysical observatory, and the meteorological observatory. And uh, quite a few experiments uh, were carried out there. So we, um, uh, there was the G value me measured, the, the value of gravity. The first earthquake was recorded, or some uh, uh, equations of the relativity theory of the fields equations were solved um, in this former institute. Since 1990 now, um, it's the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And what you can see nicely here, these buildings are still the, the old cupolas which, show, which have inside, or which used to have inside, large telescopes. And these telescopes are a bit a symbol for the first um, scientific revolution, the first Copernican revolution, um, uh, which happened about 400 years ago. And this scientific revolution was sparked by the technical development of lenses, which allowed you to use microscopes or telescopes. And this opened up a new field of research, because suddenly you could see things which were quite small, even larger. You could see things in detail, and you suddenly had a view inside the huge complexity, both inside a cell or inside of our universe. Some scholars argue that today, now we are living in the second uh, Copernican revolution. And this second Copernican revolution is triggered by the development of so-called macroscopes. Probably nobody of you ever heard this word because it's invented. Um, hello, translators. Um, but um, uh, maybe you can think what it means. It's kind of the inverse of a microscope. Instead of showing you things in more detail, actually it does the reverse. It shows you things in less detail. It reduces the complexity of the real world. And this is something that is really necessary because the complexity of the real world is sometimes overwhelming. And if you want to make decisions, we sometimes need simpler versions of the real world to understand them. So how can a microscope look like? Well, the first approach is quite straightforward. If you want to see something in less detail, you just go, st go one step back or two step backs or even further. Um, so one option is a satellite. From out of this, if you look from a satellite on the Earth, you can see the macro development on the planet. And, well, things that you can see is, first of all, the Earth is quite a beautiful planet, but you can also see um, uh, what's happening on the planet right now, that uh, streets are going into pristine forests, that we are burning down forests all over the world, um, uh, that at night time the, the Earth is still illuminated by electric lights from the cities. And you can see how strongly we already shape the, the way the planet looks like today. You can clearly see that we are now living already in the Anthropocene. A second option to see the, the, the Earth system in a reduced form is you can rebuild it in a smaller scale. 
This has, been uh, this has been carried out in the 1990s with the Biosphere 2 experiment. Um, it's basically a whole Earth system in a glass house, in a confined glass house, which has an ocean, which has a rainforest and a desert, and also eight human scientists living within. And it, you can see it as a successful failure in the way that um, uh, after a very short time already, the whole ecosystem collapsed. The fish in the oceans died. Um, uh, the ecosystems were run over by cockroaches and ants. The CO2 levels rose extremely. Um, and the, the scientists, which were basically confined in this, um, uh, were qu getting quite hungry. And towards the end of the experiments, they actually had to import food from outside of the system. So it's not as easy to rebuild such an Earth system. And actually, we can be happy that we are living in such a stable one as we have currently on the planet Earth. Now, the last, the third option of uh, reducing complexity is we put the real world into a set of equations, a computer model, and use this computer model to simulate the Earth system. Um, uh, there's a clear advantage of this. First of all, it's quite cheap, so you can repeat it. You can do several, um, uh, well, thousands of, of simulations. And of course, in reality, we only have one planet, right? So we can only carry out one experiment, and that's the experiment we're currently living in. Um, so there is no option to repeat it if we fucked up the climate or something else. Sorry. Um, so this has been the first computer model or the first widely known computer model. It's the World 3 model from 1972, um, uh, known by the report The Limits of Growth of the Club of Rome. The basic message was that if you have exponential growth of the population and exponential growth of the economy, um, uh, while you have limited natural resources, there will be one point where the, the, the social system collapses, where the population is going down up to a level where the planet can sustain it again. Of course, this was one of the first computer models. It was really simple. It was also being heavily criticized for being oversimplified. And luckily for us, um, uh, those projections didn't become true. Um, uh, but it already shows, by triggering off a quite a big debate, um, that it was quite a useful um, uh, computer model, because suddenly we were thinking long periods forward, and, um, uh, and of course we did not stop with this one computer model, but we continuously further developed it. So this was 1972, 35, more than 35 years ago. And um, uh, since then, of course, computers became much more powerful and, of course, also some a bit slower technological progress in the science community happened. So we are still on the challenge of making good, simplified computer models. Of course, they are wrong. That's what a model is always, because it's simplified. It leaves out processes that are important, but they are useful for us for decision making. So at Potsdam Institute, we have a, quite an ensemble of different models. Um, uh, here you can see, for example, climate models feeding information to a vegetation model, which calculates carbon stocks and natural vegetation, crop yields, uh, hydrology, and so on. Then we have information from such a uh, vegetation model uh, being handed over to a land use and agriculture model, which is the model called MAGPIE. And then we also have a macroeconomic model and energy model, which simulates the development of the industry, of the service sector, of the, um, uh, of the energy sector, and of course also always the greenhouse gas emissions. I want to focus today on the MAGPI model. MAGPI stands for Model of Agricultural Production and its Impact on the Environment. This is uh, the model I'm working with. Um, it's developed by a large group of approximately currently 15 people um, uh, of various scientific backgrounds. So we have economists, um, uh, we have phys uh, physicists, we have um, uh, um, uh, biologists, geologists, and so on. 
And the basic question that we want to answer with our model is how will the agro-food system look like in the year 2050 and beyond? Why is this important? Probably for you, agriculture is not so important. Hardly anyone still works in agriculture. But for our planet, agriculture is really important. It's our main interface with the nature. If you look at our planet, 30% of the terrestrial surface is covered by agriculture, either by cropland or pastures. Um, uh, if you look at greenhouse gas emissions, 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from land use change and agriculture. So again, uh, strongly with agriculture. If you look at water, 70% of human water withdrawals are for irrigation water. Um, if you look at water pollution at herbicides, at biodiversity, always there is um, the agriculture as the, one of the major drivers. Also, we are now really changing the nutrient cycles of the world, um, increasing, for example, the nitrogen cycle by factor three or four. Um, relatively to earlier years. And there's also another thing. Of course, agriculture is also really important for us humans because we can live without energy, we can't live without food. And if you look at the, the global 19 uh, leading risk factors worldwide um, uh, for preliminary death, 11 of them are connected somehow to nutrition. So either we eat too much, which is red, or too little, which is green. Um, uh, it's something like iron, zinc deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, suboptimal breastfeeding. But on the other hand, there's also a lot of things connected to unhealthy diets like high blood pressure, high blood glucose, overweight and obesity. On these top 19, you cannot find wars or terrorism or something like that, but it's really about, mostly about chronic diseases, and most of the chronic diseases are strongly connected with our daily diets. So, how does a, such a model look like? Basically, we start off with the food requirements. What do people actually eat? And what, or what do they actually need as food to sustain their body functions? Well, this, of course, depends on um, how large the population is and what each of them eats. At the moment, we are already at a world population of 7.6 billion, um, uh, and we are still growing. We will most likely be um, 8.5 to 10 billion people in the year 2050, so then we need to do some more uh, refragmentation here. Um, uh, and eventually afterwards, there is an option that it might decline or further increase, and this depends a lot of, on education and on uh, family planning. At the same time, what people need um, uh, to sustain their body functions per capita is, is quite, um, uh, is quite, uh, quite always the same, actually. Um, uh, there are some differences depending on demography. You can see that Africa has a lower requirement because there a lot of young kids are. Uh, in contrast, in China, a lot of uh, young adults, uh, you have high food requirements. But of course, this will shift as soon as we have demographic change in the future, and then we'll have, in contrast, high food requirements in Africa per capita. But in, in general, the range is really low. 2,000 to 2,300 kilocalories per capita per day in population average. But this is, of course, what the people would require. What they actually, um, what they actually consume is much more. So you can see in Germany, we have 3,500 kilocalories. In India, it's closer to the food requirements of 2,450. But you can also see not only that there's a lot of overconsumption, you can also see that the diets are quite different. In Germany, we eat quite a lot of animal products, uh, which people in Nigeria or India don't. And we actually don't eat too much fruits and vegetables, which is a shame for us. Um, uh, but um, uh, you can see that about, we consume about one-third more than we need. And what's the reason for this? Basically, it's that we waste most of our, uh, quite a substantial fraction of our food. About 30% of the food gets wasted in households, um, uh, just because people 
well, don't care too much about it. Um, uh, and you can see a quite strong correlation. Um, uh, so as soon as um, uh, people increase their living standards, as soon as the human development index increases, you also see that the, the, the food waste is starting or the overconsumption. This also includes uh, overconsumption in the sense that people eat more calories, but also there the window is quite narrow. Most of it is food waste. Okay, and the same you can see for uh, per capita calories in or the, the share of livestock products. You can see that the, the share of livestock products strongly increases uh, with income. On the left, you see just a, a, um, a scatter plot between income and the livestock share for all countries of the world for the last 50 years. And you can see that countries strongly increase their meat consumption, especially for when they move from very low incomes to medium incomes. For very high incomes, eventually the, the livestock share declines again. And you see the same actually also for processed foods like oil, sugar consumption goes up. Um, unfortunately, you don't see it for fruits and vegetables, which would be healthy, but there it saturates quite as an early income. And then, of course, these food, the food demand um, has to be satisfied by production. Before that, there is some trade, international trade is increasing over the last decades quite strongly, much more than production. And next to food demand, there is also the demand for materials, but also for bioenergy, which will play a role, an increasing role. I don't know if you heard the talk before, um, uh, which may play an increasing role in the future if we want to mitigate climate change, because bioenergy is one option to um, uh, take CO2 emissions again out of the atmosphere. And then uh, food is, of course, also processed. And here, the livestock products really play a huge role, because in order to feed one or in order to produce one calorie of livestock products, you need multiple um, plant calories to feed the animal. At the moment, approximately half of the proteins that are produced worldwide on the crop lands are fed to animals. And um, additionally, also a large, uh, even larger quantity of, of pasture, which is grazed by animals. And finally, we have crops, and these crops are standing on a land. And here you can see some land use dynamics. Here you can see a projection or a scenario, a future scenario of um, uh, how the cropland might expand in the future. Quite strong expansion, especially in the tropical areas, because there also the population growth is largest. And uh, next to land use, this also, well, on the one hand, you have cropland expansion, but this is not the only option, of course, to increase production. In the past, this made all up only 10% of the increase of production. The largest increase actually came always from the intensification of the existing areas. And here you can see uh, the, the, basically the crop yields that we would need in the future in order to sustain our, um, uh, or, or to fulfill the demand. And finally, our model also considers all the interactions with the, the biochemical cycles. So how do we change the nitrogen, the carbon, the phosphorus cycle? Um, also, how will water scarcity change? This is a picture where you can see the water scarcity in 2010 and 2050. So it's basically not the water scarcity, but the, how much of the water that is available will be under use. And um, uh, the nitrogen cycle, as the third most important um, uh, uh, biochemical cycle of the world has been changed tremendously by modern agriculture. We are now about five times the amount of nitrogen which flows through the cycle than in pre-industrial times. And finally, we end up with emissions and um, uh, well, if we assume a scenario where we don't take action, we can assume that, uh, or we, we simulate that the emissions will further increase, while actually, in order to keep um, uh, or stay below the two degree aim, we would actually need the land use sector to sequester carbon. So we need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. This is something that only the land use sector can provide at low costs, either through afforestation, through plantation of biomass, 
or through uh, ac accumulation of carbon in soils. So this is the whole integrated model, and the great thing is that, um, uh, well, it's um, an optimization model where everything influences everything. So if you put a carbon price in, this will change the, the whole supply chain. It will change the food demand. It will change the global trade patterns. It will change the land use pattern. If you, you can also see the interactions, for example, between the nitrogen and the water cycle or um, uh, how, um, uh, well, uh, but you can also see quite well the trade-offs that exist in our, in our Earth system. So if you only want to solve one specific aim, it's still, well, quite, quite easily possible. Um, but as soon as you have multiple goals, for example, if you want to provide enough food for, for the whole world population, this will also require you to increase your food, food production and then you will have the environmental impact. If you want to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you, you will need bioenergy, and this, of course, also has negative impacts again on biodiversity, on food consumption, on food prices, and so on. So it's a very complex system, and um, uh, it's, it's a really a challenge, but it's possible um, uh, to transform our society sustainably that we actually meet all these goals at the same time. What's really crucial there is, on the one hand, the consumption side. So we really need to reduce food waste and we need to reduce the consumption of animal products by large scale. So having animal consumption, having the food waste in Western society would be something that we should aim for. And this is really difficult. Um, at the same time, the whole production system can be much more efficient. A small price on, on carbon would be sufficient to trigger off technical innovations probably and to implement low-cost carbon uh, mitigation technologies. But these are probably the two things that we need most. We need um, a, a, um, a policy that puts prices on emissions, on carbon, on nitrogen, on water uh, pollution, and we need some kind of policies that change the preferences of the people in a way that they, for example, education, school education for what is a healthy diet, how, how do you cook at home, and so on. All, the, all these kind of projects have to be really encouraged. So, what can you do? Well, one advice I would to want to give out is um, get involved in modeling. Um, uh, most of us are actually, uh, um, uh, well, we are, we are not computer scientists uh, from the beginning, but we have to learn quite a lot of, the, of this, but we are rather coming from disciplinary backgrounds, economists or, or uh, biologists or something like that. And, but most of our time is actually software development. And um, uh, it's not that we don't want software developers, it's just that few people actually apply there. So uh, I think putting up the standards of software development in the whole field would be really a great thing. Um, uh, the second thing is there's a lot of data out um, and uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, well, also uh, great signs that could be communicated um, uh, using good visualization techniques using um, also maybe artistic projects and so on. Just want to give you one example before I come to the question and answer. Here in the last year we, we made a, a workshop with art students uh, who developed interactive installations using our data. For example, here it's an audio installation where people could hear the sound of different um, uh, scenarios depending on whether it's a um, a scenario where all the, the forests are cut down and you have rather agricultural sounds or more urban sounds in another scenario. Um, or um, maybe I just pick one more because we have limited time. This is a, um, an artwork by a student from Bangladesh and um, uh, she created a climate box. You can enter this climate box, throw in a coin, and then um, uh, using an Arduino, it, um, it all starts moving. You get told the story of climate change. 
um, uh, but at the same time also the weather in the climate box is changing so suddenly it becomes hotter and there's a fan blowing in hot air and um, uh, suddenly it starts raining and there's flashlights um, uh, and then uh, if you don't spend more money on it um, uh, then it becomes even worse and worse and worse <laughs> so This artwork was actually inspired because she said, well, people back home, they, they see climate change as something abstract, but as long as they don't feel it, they wouldn't do something. So she came up with this idea. Okay, now I'm ready for question and answers. Thank you very much. Okay. Everybody with questions, please go to the microphones in the room and uh, internet over the signal angels. So, microphone one, please. Um, oops, it's charged. I got an electrocution here. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. One question. When you looked at the needs of people, you spoke about calorie requirements. However, nutrition is much more than calories, and especially in not, not in Germany, but in um, the Sahel area, when you further reduce the animal protein part, um, you get problems with malnutrition. Is that something you factor in, or is it just plain calories and you eat sorghum with sorghum? No, of course, um, uh, dietary, dietary diversity is really important. Um, I would not say that animal protein is the only way of, of, of um, uh, solving this, um, uh, because um, uh, you can have a um, a balanced diet also without animal protein. But it's important, actually, one of the most important challenges is to drive up the consumption of vegetables and fruits um, uh, by, by, by several factors. Um, and there's hardly any um, positive limitation to the, uh, the, especially for vegetables, to the health impacts of um, higher consumption of vegetables of, of, and fruits. Of course, we look at the dietary composition and um, uh, there we also don't only look at, at uh, livestock versus plant calories, but also now on fruits and vegetables and on processed calories. Um, but yeah, of course, I think it's a, it's a major problem that we should not play out goals like food security against goals like climate change. We need to simply tackle both of them and as urgently as possible. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. We have five minutes. So next microphone number two, please. Sorry, I think I'm too small for this one. Okay, um, so I've got two questions. Uh, you were talking about trade-offs. So what would you think is the best solution to the crucial trade-off between um, biodiversity and land conversion for food security? And the second question is, you were talking about how important it is that uh, we invest in societies drive up our vegetable and fruit consumption. But this again would mean that we shift um, the land usage for um, high calorie foods, even if they are not um, dairy or well livestock in any way, um, so that again we use more land, and this again would cause more well rivalry between uh, global food users. Um, isn't this? contradictory to food security and aren't we quite healthy already if we stopped eating sugar like crazy? Thank you. Okay, okay um, uh, from... Uh, I forgot the first question again. <laughs> what, was, what was the first question? Ah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's certainly a, um, uh, a trade off between those two. But as I said in, before, um, uh, in the past, only 10% or the, or the cropland in the last 50 years only increased by approximately 10, 11%. And all the rest of the productivity improvements were actually reached on 
uh, on the area. At the moment, there are quite large yield gaps in wide, er wide areas of the world where you could actually intensify um, uh, and where it would be actually good to intensify the systems um, uh, to a certain degree and uh, without any land expansion actually necessary. There are certain areas where I guess land expansion is possible. Um, it's always a trade-off, of course. Um, uh, and we are trying to build in exactly this trade-off by now, including biodiversity indicators in our model, but this is still a work in progress. Uh, to the second question on the fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables actually make up only a tiny share of current land use. Um, I think less than, uh, less than 10%, definitely. Um, uh, and at the same time, uh, they are producing quite high yields because um, uh, it's not the land which is the, the, the main resource there, but it's labor which goes in and um, capital. It's not necessarily a clean production either, because you have large nutrient runoffs, often large pesticide use. But in terms of land use, it's not such a bad uh, thing. You get quite high um, uh, tons of um, uh, product produce out of a vegetable farm. Um, uh, but of course, there are also trade-offs here. There's a sustainable, probably if sugar is providing really cheap calories. Um, uh, without large environmental footprint if you calculate it per calorie. In contrast, fruits and vegetables provide very little calories, but provide a very nutritious food in terms of fiber, vitamins, and so on. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I see eight and one from the internet. Uh, I, we have just two minutes, so I take one from the internet, one from five, and I ask everybody else to ask the uh, speaker afterwards. Here, he is here and he answers all your questions. So, internet, what is your question? Okay, so the ISC asks, how do I get involved in modeling? Can I play with Magpie by downloading code and data somewhere? Hello, Internet. Um, uh, the, the model will become open source next year. So we are currently um, in the process of the whole legal stuff of making it open source. Um, so the next model version of our model will be published open source. Microphone five, please. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, yes, uh, last year there was also an awesome talk about um, food, um, plant-based food innovation that, are, that is science-based. So my question is twofold. First, um, do you implement technological innovation that would lead to a more plant-based um, diet and um, in general in the model? And the second one, how hopeful are you personally that those will have an, an important impact in the future? You're speaking now of some kind of um, plant-based meat replacement products and so on. Um, yes, we, we, we actually published a study or a commentary this year also on um, a quite extreme case of this, which is basically landless food production. So you can breed microbes based on uh, fertilizer and energy. Um, uh, it's a kind of a space uh, food technology. It was developed by the Russians, but now it actually becomes commercial, um, uh, commercially cheap. Um, uh, I guess it will certainly happen for certain uh, protein foods. So it will, for example, replace um, uh, soybean or fish meal in animal feeding to a certain proportion. Um, I'm not so sure about the, the actual nutrition value of this um, or about, well, I'm a bit skeptical how, how positive I would judge it, but I would judge it quite realistic also for the, the whole meat replacement products based on, on plant-based um, uh, uh, on plant basis, I think it will become economically just cheaper and then uh, you will have a, a, a tipping point where simply because out of economic reason it's cheaper, people will reduce their meat consumption or, for example, a burger will consist of half fake meat and half real meat because it's cheaper. And um, I think this transformation will happen. Somehow the, the breeding animals just for, for, for their meat seems a technology which is somehow outdated for the 21st century, if you ask me.
Then give more than a big applause to Dr. Benjamin Leon Podieski. Podieski. <laughs> Thank you.